In this chapter, we are going to learn how a British company that came to India as a trading company to do business went on to acquire territories and established an empire that ruled India for more than 200 years. First, let me make a timeline, an empty timeline. As we go ahead, we will start filling in the dates of the events and it will be easier for you to follow up. Great. First thing first, the Indian history has been divided into three parts and they are ancient history, medieval history and then modern history. Now, modern history is the part where we typically talk about the time when India was under the rule of British Empire. And medieval history is the time from 8th to 18th century. In the later part of this time period, India was under the Islamic rule that is from 13th to 18th century. During this time, the famous Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal Empire were the direct rulers of major portion of the Indian subcontinent. So to understand the British rule in India, we have to go a little backward towards the end of medieval period when the Mughal Empire came to an end after the death of their last influential and powerful emperor. Here are the list of Mughal emperors who ruled India. In this, Aurangzeb was the last powerful Mughal ruler. After him, none of them were that influential. However, Bahadur Shah Zafar was the last emperor till 1857. So we can say that the Mughal Empire officially came to an end by 1857. Nevertheless, situation changed right after the death of Aurangzeb. So that's where the real story starts. One more thing you need to remember here is that the Europeans had already discovered India way before Mughal invasion. Mughal era started in 1526 with Babur being the first emperor. If you remember Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese explorer, he was the first European to discover the sea route to India in 1498. He went to the harbor in Calicut, which is now Kohikode, on the Malabar coast. There they had set up their first trading post. Moments back I said that Aurangzeb was the last powerful Mughal ruler, but he died in 1707. We'll now put this date on the timeline. Now as soon as a powerful influential ruler died, all of his governors, who were also known as Subedas and the big Zamindas, they all slowly started dividing because it is now beneficial for them to establish their own small regional kingdoms so that they can be the king. It's like now the emperor is dead, so forget Delhi, forget the center, no one cares what's going to happen. Let's get back to our regional places and establish our own rule. Things of that sort were happening. Now we have the dates 1707 and 1498. Let's get to know what happened in between. At 1498, Portuguese came to India, they came to Calicut. After the Portuguese, the Dutch fleet arrived in Pulicut in 1595. Then came the British, who landed in Surat in 1608. After them, the Danish came to Trankebar in Tamil Nadu in 1616. And at last, the French came to Pondicherry in 1664. They all were collectively called as European traders. Cool, now that we have the dates on the timeline, let's understand how the British arrived in India, because that's what we are interested in. So you see, everyone arrived at different locations. Since Portuguese came to India almost 100 years before any of the European traders, they had more number of trading posts compared to other European traders. Let's understand how the British arrived in India, because that's what we are interested in. So it all started in 1600. The English company acquired a charter from the then ruler of England, Queen Elizabeth I. Charter means a written legislative paper of a country. So Queen Elizabeth I signed a paper where she gave, in particular, this English company complete individual right to trade with the eastern countries. Now with this charter, the company went to the eastern side through ocean route looking for new lands from which it could buy goods at cheap price and carry them back to Europe to sell at higher prices. Basically, they wanted to be the loan shark. And why so? Because as per the signed charter, no other English trading company could trade. But then, if you look at the timeline, there are other European traders that already arrived in India before the British, like the Portuguese and Dutch. So that means Britain was not alone. While they didn't see any competition from their own country, but their competition were the other European traders. Remember this. Okay, now that everyone has arrived on the scene, there comes a big problem. All these European trading companies were interested in buying the same products and that was fine qualities of cotton and silk. Apart from silk, they were also interested in spices like pepper, cloves, cardamom and cinnamon. These all had huge market demand in Europe. So they all had a plan to take it back to European market and sell it for higher prices to make huge profit. You see, now the Britain is no more the lone shark. There are other sharks in the competition. Now seeing this demand, the Indian traders who were selling these goods to them, they increased the prices of goods. And that's an obvious demand price economics. If the demand is high, naturally the prices would go up. 
This in turn affected the profit margin of these European traders. So instead of finding different ways to minimize the cost, the only reasonable solution they could think of was to eliminate their competitors. Now you see the sharks are fighting among themselves. This led to fierce battles between these European trading companies. All throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, that is from 1600 to 1700, they regularly sank each other's ships, blocked routes, and prevented rival ships from moving with supplies of goods. They even fortified their posts, meaning they built big walls to protect their trading post. Now here's the funny thing. When you fortify your trading post and try to maximize your profits in foreign location, who else is going to have a problem? Let me ask this question in a different manner so that you understand better. If there are two or three guests who came to your home and they are fighting with each other constantly, they are building walls of separation on your property, who is going to get pissed? It's going to be you. Similarly, the local rulers were getting angry. This led to intense conflict with local rulers. So now we have the European traders fighting with each other, then the local rulers are fighting with them, and these traders in return are fighting with the rulers. The English company had to then start politics. And it was difficult to separate politics from trade. I think you understand why politics was necessary. This kept on going till 1651, when they finally decided to set up their first English factory on the banks of River Hooghly. Now this was an important step for the British, because prior to this, they only had a trading post. And now they actually built a fully equipped factory with warehouses to stock their supplies, and also offices where the company officials would sit. As trade expanded, the company persuaded merchants and traders to come and settle near the factory. By 1696, it began building a fort around the settlement. Two years later, in 1698, it bribed Mughal officials into giving the company zamindari rights over three villages. One of the village was Kalikata, which is known today by the name Kolkata. Keeping in mind, the Mughal emperor during this time was Aurangzeb. The English company also persuaded Aurangzeb to issue a Farman. A Farman is a royal order, like how the English acquired a charter in the beginning from the Queen, so Farman is similar to that. In fact, they even acquired a Farman from the Emperor Jahangir while setting up their first trading post in Surat. So this Farman that they wanted from Aurangzeb had a condition that would give the company the right to trade duty free. Now you do understand this would cause enormous loss of revenue for Bengal. But the company did not care. In fact, they went for more and more concessions and wanted more privileges. Now I'll tell you where they actually wanted more of such privileges. So the main objective of the company was to buy goods and ship it back to the European market to earn profit. This was the initial main goal. But then it would be naive to say that the company had all loyal officials and that they were doing all fair trade. No, it had many corrupt officials who were doing private trade. Many of the officials about whom we will read further, because it is interesting to know they made millions of pounds and lived a lavish lifestyle back in England by doing private trade. So we just read that the officials of the company who were carrying on private trade on the side were not paying any tax. Now this was causing heavy loss of revenue to the Bengal government. If you look at the timeline, we are now somewhere in the beginning of the 18th century, that is 1700. And then in 1707, the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb died. This is an important milestone because from here situation changed drastically. You remember in the beginning I said Aurangzeb was the last powerful Mughal Emperor? So after his death, Bahadur Shah I was the next Mughal Emperor. But he was not that powerful. And the reason we can draw such a conclusion is because of the fact that after the death of Aurangzeb, all the regional Nawabs wanted to execute their power and authority in their respective regions. So this clearly tells us that Bahadur Shah I was not as influential as Aurangzeb. After Bahadur Shah I, his son Jahandar Shah and after him Farukh Siyar became the emperor. In a moment I'll tell you the role of Farukh Siyar. So we know that all regional Nawabs wanted to execute their power and authority in their respective regions. The same happened in Bengal as well. Mushid Kuli Khan was the Nawab of Bengal from 1717 to 1727. And he was also the first Nawab of Bengal and a strong ruler. And I've also told you that the company was doing unfair trade as well as tax-free trade and it was causing huge revenue loss to the Bengal government. Now this was a serious concern for Mushid Kuli Khan because he was the Nawab and the ruler of Bengal. So naturally this behavior of the company was making the Nawab angry. 
Now the Nawab of Bengal had to show the English company who the real boss is. Because now the Mughal emperor was Farooqiyar and after Aurangzeb, none of them were powerful enough to defend the English. So clearly Mushid Kuli Khan had to take matters in his own hands because he was the Nawab of Bengal. He had to defend his region. And this led to serious conflicts between the company and the Nawab of Bengal. Mushid Kuli Khan eventually died in 1727. And he also had successors just like any other ruler. But I want you to know that there were only three Nawabs including Mushid Kuli Khan who were strong rulers of Bengal. Otherwise, if we go on to talk about each and every person's detailed account, then history becomes a never-ending subject. So fast forward to the next strong ruler, Alivardi Khan. He became the Nawab in 1740. He ruled for almost 16 years and in his 16 years of power, he was mostly engaged in various wars against the Marathas. Because Maratha was another empire in India who wanted to establish their rule just like the Mughals. In fact, they are also credited to a large extent for ending the Mughal rule in India. Anyways, back to the storyline. Towards the end of Alivadi Khan's 16 years of power, he turned his attention to rebuilding and restoring Bengal. And that's when his focus shifted to the English company. And then even he died in 1756. The third strong ruler of Bengal was Sirajit Dola. He was the grandson of Alivadi Khan. He became the Nawab in 1756, soon after the death of Alivardi Khan, who was his maternal grandfather. Even Sirajud Dollar did not like the English company's behaviour and their way of trade, and he wanted to do something about the situation, because the company was depriving the Bengal government of huge amounts of revenue and undermining the authority of the Nawab. So if at all a question comes, what were the reasons behind or what led to the conflicts between the Nawabs of Bengal and the English company? The answer would be, the company was not paying taxes, they were expanding their fortification, they were causing the Bengal government heavy loss of revenue, they were writing disrespectful letters and trying to humiliate the Nawab and his officials. So these were the reasons behind the conflict between the Nawabs of Bengal and the English company. Till now we have heard the Nawab's side of story and as usual every story has two sides. So now let's hear what the company's justification to these allegations were. The company said that the unjust demands of the Bengal government were ruining the trade of the company and trade could flourish only if the duties were removed. They also said to expand trade the company had to enlarge its settlements, buy up villages and rebuild its forts. This was the company's justification. Obviously both the Nawab and the company had different views, clearly contradicting each ones. And finally this led to the famous battle of Plassey. We'll get back in the next video and we will learn more about the Battle of Plassey.